Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to every ladies and a few gentlemen. I think I saw like three or four of you. Fantastic. Hey, you're a good man filling in on the mat, ladies. Every woman raising kids needs a good man. Uh, Karen, I wanted to start off by asking you, first of all, by saying to you, I've been dying to talk to you. I watch you through the screen all the time. I saw that steely look in your eyes when the fight was on, so I've been dying to find out what was going on behind that. But first of all, aside from all the committees we heard that you were a part of, yes. you have two high-profile careers, a husband and two young kids. Yes. Tell me about your challenges getting here this morning for 7.15. <laughs> you know what, actually today was a good morning because usually I walk the dog. And uh, so I said to my husband, look, I need to be downtown early. Can you walk the dog? He said, no problem. So it was good and the kids were asleep. So I got out of the house, I got out of walking the dog and I got out before the kids woke up. So. Yay! <laughs> And the good news is I'll be home early tonight, so I'll be there for bedtime. Fantastic. Uh, uh, tell me, who did you leave behind at home? Tell all of us who you left behind. So my, uh, my son, Jackson, he's eight. And my daughter, Haley's five. And so they are... And your dog. And my dog is Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> and he's my dog, actually. Like, yeah, he's my dog. He is your dog. And uh, my husband, Daryl. And, uh, and my dad actually also lives with us as well. Fantastic. So, so you are doing that sandwich generation that we hear so much about. Yeah. A parent at home and young kids at home as well. We'll ask you more about that a little bit later. Let's just dive right in okay. to what all of us know you for, and that is the woman who took on Rob Ford and won. Yeah. <laughs> and she laughs. <laughs> and, and some applause. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me just ask you, what possessed you? You were on council from 2003, so Mayor David Miller was there. You guys were on opposite ends of the political spectrum, found it challenging, tough to move ahead. Yeah. Ford Nation comes in. Not only do you get to be sort of part of the inner circle, but you get appointed as chair of the TTC, transit being one of his main platforms. Yes. He puts you in as chair. What possessed you to then stand up and say, yeah, I'm going to go a different way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, um, so there was, the plan that was announced by Mayor Ford had um, issues associated with it. And there was this view that, well, you know what, um, you know, we just need to get moving with transit. I think there was a general belief in the city, if we, can make, if we can agree on Eglinton, we'll just continue to go and move forward on Eglinton and we'll just, you know what, we'll just solve the problems later. And so there was, there was this view that we knew there was problems with the Mayor Ford's plan, but we, just, we knew we had no funding for Shepherd. We knew there was problems with the Eglinton as proposed project, but we thought, you know, we just need to move forward and we'll fix the problems later. So after we did the announcement, uh, we began to talk to the mayor's office about some of the problems with his plan. Um, the fact we had no money, the fact the private sector doesn't build subways for free, and the fact that when you um, spend $700 million buying light rail vehicles, you don't bury them because they're intended to operate a grade. And so we began those discussions with the mayor and the mayor's office in, in more of a, okay, so here's some issues. They're not, you know, we can overcome them, but we just need to identify them. And, and after the better part of seven months, we were just getting nowhere. And there was this, this, um, this belief that if I don't recognize there's a problem, then there's no problem. And so the issues continued to emerge. And there was at one point I thought, and I, and I had that moment, and it was, you know what, I'm not going to be here, likely, when they cut the ribbon on the Edmonton Cross Town. But if I don't do something to solve what it, the problem that I know exists, then I will have been responsible for basically misallocating $2 billion of taxpayer money. And whether I'm there to cut the ribbon or not, I will forever live with the knowledge that I didn't do everything that I could to make sure that that money was spent in the best way possible. And that was what made you decide to take the it was, it was that moment I said, you know what, this can't continue. So why not just step down as chair then? Why take a, make a public statement? Yeah, and so that was, so there's that moment of clarity, and then, then there's the events of life. <laughs> and so I had said to the mayor, you know, I can't support this plan. And that was my first step. And we had lots of challenges along the way, and in fact, there was, a, on at least two occasions, I had invited him to replace me as chair. And he didn't accept that offer, and so I, I continued on in my role, continued to highlight these issues, continued to say there was problems. I, I finally told him I didn't support his plan. And it was at that moment then events began to unfold where they had buried a report at the commission. I lost, I lost control of the commission. I was losing votes. And I knew that there was a report coming forward that was going to outline all of the problems. And, and I had told the mayor this report's coming and he used his majority on the commission to bury that report. And once he did that, then 
it changed the game. And that's when I had the support on council to call the special meeting, which had never been done before, and launched that process that whereby we reinstituted the leg rope. There, it would not have been possible without the support of the council and my team and a, a whole group of people that just stood behind me. Because there's that moment in time when you're going forward and you're like, what am I doing? Am I insane? Like, I don't need to do this. Right. Even though you know you do, there's still that moment of, you know, what am I really doing here? Support of council is tricky for you, though. So for people who don't know, um, politically, you were aligned more with Ford Nation. Yes. Yes. So to now get support of council, you are opposing that party, and you have to now gain friends with people who may not have been friends or allies with you previous at council. Yes, and that was, um, that was a, I would say, one of the best moments for me at council because I, for the first time, worked on issues the way issues are supposed to be worked on, which is cross politics and, and, and in a nonpartisan way. So I was able to form relationships with people that I hadn't worked, even though we'd worked together for seven years, we hadn't actually worked as partners. And so Joe Mahavik, Glenda Bearmaker, John Parker, um, reaching across the aisle to work with people in, an, in, a, in a new collaborative way was, was a really incredible experience. Some people might look at that and say, that's a really good way to get folks to run for the next mayoral election <laughs> <laughs> and get support of other councillors. So uh, do you want to be mayor of Toronto? I, you know, I think um, being mayor of Toronto is, is one of the greatest jobs that there is. And, um, but it's, it's, it's we have a mayor, and um, my role is to support the city. And I, know, I don't see myself as opposing the mayor. I see myself as promoting the city. And so in my perfect world, I would actually prefer not to be opposing the mayor. But would, in your perfect world, you like to be mayor of Toronto? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, <laughs> I think being mayor of Toronto would be one of the best jobs. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> all right. Tell us about behind the scenes and at home when all this fight is going on. Everybody in this room knows what it's like to get to work when you have a challenge and you have a battle. It's exhausting. It's draining. Your days were long. We saw that. Uh, what was it like for you at home while this was going on? It was exciting. Yeah, because my husband um, at the time was traveling. He had a, hit a job where he was traveling. So in the month of February, he was gone for three weeks. And so that's when you just call in the resources. So I called upon friends, I called upon colleagues, my father, my mother-in-law, and it was really the group effort to kind of make sure that we could continue on. How did you have enough energy to walk the dog and get your kids off to school? <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it, it was adrenaline. So it was just February, March, got through. April, I actually almost collapsed. April, I had a hard time getting to work. So it was sort of all that build up, all of that stress. We, we made it through, we, um, we did what we needed to do. And then when April came, was, uh, that was sort of when everything collapsed. So those are the defining moments, I think, that everybody is interested in, the choice between collapsing or pushing yourself to keep going. So where did you get the strength from to do that? Uh, after April? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, the, the realization that we still had more work to do. And so even though we had gotten through the four light rail lines, we still have a lot of work ahead of us around building a transit plan, figuring out how we're going to fund it. And it was my, again, being re-engaged in the work that needs to get done that actually got me out of the April funk and back onto promoting the city. When you, the April funk, is that what it will forever be the known April as funk. in your life, is yeah. the April funk? OK. When you, the night that you won, what did you do? I went home. You went home? Yeah. You didn't go out and celebrate? No. Because it was a lot of work to get there. <laughs> it was. It was. But it, um, it was a victory, but it didn't feel like a celebration. And again, because of all the controversy, and there was a lot of negativity, and it was, um, you know, the mayor had said the vote didn't matter, and we knew we weren't out of the woods yet because we still had the, um, we still had the, the decision to make on Shepherd. I didn't know if I was going to get fired. So <laughs> I actually expected I was going to get fired. So it was, um, and I was tired. So no, I just went home. Uh, I want to ask you quickly about that. You haven't been fired. No. You have not been taken away as the chair of the TTC. What does that say about uh, Mayor Ford and about your relationship with Mayor Ford? Well, that was um, a funny moment because um, th th what the mayor didn't know is that he had actually changed the rules around appointments. <laughs> and so when he, when he appointed me as chair, the, um, the, the, the TTC actually chose the chair. But during 
Mayor Ford's term, he changed that process whereby council would appoint the chair. And it was, it was a more broad sweeping arrangement, not just specific to the TTC, but for the zoo, for TCHC, for the TTC, for a number of other, for the library, agencies, boards, and commissions, it was council that would choose. <laughs> so in between the time that he made that change and the whole light rail decision, um, he, he, he actually didn't know that he didn't have the ability to have me fired. <laughs> That was tricky, Karen. Yeah, so it was, so it was a bit of luck. It was a bit of luck. So it, it, I actually didn't know. I thought he could fire me too because I had clearly lost control of the commission. While I had the majority of council, I didn't have control of the commission. So I thought, okay, here we go. And um, and then then I learned that he couldn't. He actually couldn't command that majority to fire me. I'm like, wait for primal scream. <laughs> <laughs> Heard primal scream. <laughs> so, and so, uh, but. But that being said, and, and again, not to get too into the details of the politics because it, it's not really relevant, but um, when he couldn't fire me, um, and then, but then he did command the majority of the commission to fire the chief general manager, Gary Webster. I think that was really another low point. And, um, and again, council rallied around that one and said, you know, you just can't do that. Right? You, just, you just can't fire someone because you didn't like what they said. When you walk into council now, it's, it's a new game. You have new friends. You have new enemies. If we frenemies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your advice to people who are facing adversity at work right now. I mean, there are people who have publicly called for you to be fired, oh, called you a traitor. Yeah. yeah. I think um, when you, when, it, it's that conviction, that, it, that moment of clarity, where when you think you have to do something because you can't live with the consequence of not acting, it actually shields you from a lot of, a, a lot of the criticism that you're going to hear. Because you're, you're grounded in that view that, you know, I, I know, I know what the challenges were, I know what the problems were, I had to do something to solve them. It's why I was elected. Fundamentally, although I served at the pleasure of the mayor when he appointed me, I'm elected and accountable to those who voted for me. And they expect, and they sent me here, to do what I'm doing. And so the people that called me traitors and backstabbers and, and you know, they, they're entitled to that point of view, but ultimately I'm accountable to the, to, to the good people who sent me here, and I believe that I'm doing their service. What did your dad say to you? Because you're still ultimately somebody's daughter, and he is at home, probably down the hall. What did he say to you? <laughs> My dad said he prefers subways. Oh! <laughs> Maybe don't come out to the vote. That's right. Okay. Uh, was it worth it? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely worth it. It was, um, I just, uh, I, I learned a lot about my colleagues. I learned a lot about myself. What did you learn about yourself? That um, when, when, that, that just when you have a challenge, it's so easy to, to step away from a challenge. And, and I have in my life stepped away from challenges. And this was really the first time that I was presented with a challenge. And um, I just I decided to take it on, and I took the risk, and and it worked. It worked out. But um, there's lots of challenges that I have stepped away from, and this was one that I confronted. And it, when you go through the storm, you realize that you can rely on people, that you can build new relationships, that you can um, do things you never thought were possible, that you can stand criticism. That five years ago, probably I was not as well positioned to to have handled. And um, so, just, just that, that opportunity and that ability and that, that taking on that challenge was new for me. When you are at home, uh, when do you get to be work Karen and when do you get to be mom Karen? Yeah, no, at home, I'm actually at home, I'm Jackson and Haley's mom. So it, um, it's good. When I walk through the neighborhood, I'm, I'm Jackson and Haley's mom and it's, uh, work doesn't come home. By and large, sometimes work comes home. You know, and the kids will, when my daughter was younger, when she was three, she would see me on television, and she was, Mommy, come out of the TV. <laughs> so, so that part is, you know, is kind of fun. And then, well, you know, during the election campaign, um, I had put my, sign, my picture on my sign, and, um, you know, my son, well, why are you on someone's lawn, right? So those kinds of things are kind of fun. But, um, you know, by and large, um, my kids don't really know what I do. You know, they know about Rob Ford, and they know, you know, uh, they know a little bit about stuff that goes on because we talk about it in the house. But by and large, I'm Jackson and Haley's mom. 
love when people say, tell me about work-life balance, because as anybody knows, if you ever did any kind of science classes, balance is very precarious, and one thing moves and everything's out of balance, and you gotta juggle again to try to keep everything in balance. So what do you juggle to keep in balance? What are you juggling? Yeah, so it's, um, I mean, the, the, the good news about my job is it, it's, I don't travel, it's here. It's, I live close to home, I can get home quickly. Um, but it's weekends and wait, late nights, is it not? It is, but there's also, I have, I, I say no to a lot more nights. And weekends, generally, I, can, I will do if I can bring my kids. So that's how, so I, the good news is my kids get to go to places in the city that I never went to when I was a kid. And so, and they, they think it's fun and exciting. And um, there are weeks that I'm, I'm out too many nights and then I make up for it the next week. So it's, it's, it is about choices. Do they tell you that you're out too many nights? Yeah. What do they say? They'll just say, oh, mom, again, aren't you going to be home to read me stories? And my husband will say, too, you need to come home and the kids miss you. So there is, um, there is that check on when things get too busy. And is that an internal check for you? It, it, it is both internal and then validated. And so we have, um, it, it's two things at play. Is it tough to say no in your job to work? Uh, it is tough. It is tough to say no, but it, it, it's tough. And, and you get into that, that cycle of, oh, you know, well, you know, I want to do that. I want to say yes. And then, but then it's that choice. Who am I saying yes to? Being home to read stories or, or yes to another event. And, um, and so it's, it's, some nights it's yes to stories. And no, I can't do that. You told us uh, near the beginning of our chat that uh, your father is living at home with you as well. So you're also juggling parents. You also have uh, a mom who is not living with you who uh, lives with mental illness. Can you tell us how your mom is doing? Yeah, my mom's actually quite stable, which is nice. She's, uh, she's in a good, safe environment. She's in a long-term care facility. And I see her every week. And um, she, um, she's, she's actually the most stable she's ever been, which is nice. And are you able to chat with her about work, ask her for her advice? Impressions from her? Really? Not really. She she worries a lot, and um, does she see you on the news? Yeah, she does. Yeah. <laughs> what does she think of that? <laughs> she oh, she just worries all the time, constantly. You know, oh dear, what have you done now? Why are you doing this? <laughs> you know? What, have, what mother, have you done now? Why do they always say what have you done, done now? now? <laughs> my mother will ask me this. I have three children and a job and a husband, and she'll say, now why did you do that? Right. I got it, mom. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. So no, it's um, so and, and she doesn't. She doesn't really understand uh, what I do and the challenges, and, and it, it, she's just, um, even though she's stabilized, she's not, she doesn't have that ability to comprehend all that's going on. You were raised by your dad primarily? Yeah. And how do you think that affected how you approach challenges and, uh, and things in life being raised uh, primarily by a male? Yeah, I think, um, I, so, so that I have kind of, there's, there's two parts to that question. When I, um, because I grew up with a father who's an engineer, <laughs> I, I kind of got used to the non-communicative environment. <laughs> so, and so I never, um, so being a chair of the TTC, working with all men engineers, I, I kind of get them. And so I, I felt, so I have a comfort level in that, in that environment. Um, that being said, working for the Ford administration is the first time in my life I, I, act, I absolutely felt um, an inability to, to communicate with a group of men. And I had never experienced that before. But I was completely unable to communicate to, to the Ford administration. And, 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 it, and it was just the difference of being a woman trying to communicate to a group of men who um, were, I just wasn't able to break through. So growing up with a father, engineer, non-communicative has helped me in a number of ways um, deal with an environment that's primarily male. But it didn't equip me for the Fords. Wow. It's quite a statement. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it also gave you a great love of football, I'm guessing. Is that where that came yeah, from? Yeah, I like my football. And so, so I, I, I'm an only child. I never had a brother. No, no one never played hockey in my house. My dad, NFL football, Sunday night, you know, Sunday football was what we did. And, um, and so it was, uh, that was our, that's our thing. What was your, what's your bonding time with your kids like? Football was it for you and your dad? Yeah, I mean, for us, uh, five and eight, it's, um, you know, it is it's the hockey game, or the soccer games. It's, you know, Learning how to ride ride the bike. Um, it is walking the dog because we walk the dog, and um, you know story time, and you know, just trying to carve out those 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 moments. And, and you know, they're moments that I, I I treasure, and you just hope that that they'll remember some of those first moments as they. Can. 
who are some of your female role models? If your mom wasn't always able to be present to fill yeah. that role, uh, where do you go to for that sort of female perspective on things? My mother-in-law. My mother-in-law is awesome. So she basically, um, she is, she was very young when she got married and had, and had my husband. And, um, but she has accomplished incredible things in her life and she's run marathons, rides motorcycles, <laughs> right? so she is uh, left retired from Canada Post at 55 with a full pension. Like she's just great. So she went off biking to Italy just because she could, and uh, so she's uh, she's really my inspiration. I think the great things about public life. The first thing is running for running for an election. And when I first ran, I, I it was expected that I would not win because I had the odds against me. And, um, but I can say it was really one of the most amazing things to be in your community, to meet people, to hear what they have to say, to hear what their concerns are. And um, at, at there was that point at which I thought, you know what, I want to win, of course, you don't run to lose, but um, it doesn't actually matter because it's been such a great experience. And then to be able to have a position on council where you are influencing how the city will develop over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years is uh, really a remarkable position. I want to ask you about milestones and markers really quickly because mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in those. People will say, did you always want to be a journalist? And I would say, uh, no, because I didn't always know that. But when you look back, like in third grade, when everyone else was writing like two-page stories, mine were nine pages. And I, you know, <laughs> I did public speaking in the sixth grade and started winning competitions for that. So there were little things that indicated sort of in your career choice at the end. Are there little milestones and markers that you look back at now that say, here yeah. students will take on the mayor and win? I wish I could. I really wish I could. I, I, I call myself the accidental politician because I wasn't really supposed to win in Ward 16. And um, I wasn't really, um, I, I had no expectation of being TTC chair because I didn't endorse the mayor. So but earlier than that, like no. back in school, no. did you stand up? No, you... I, wish I, could, I wish I could tell you I was hopelessly shy. Really? Hopelessly shy. Yeah. <laughs> Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you had to be like, were, you, were you scared of your own voice? Did you think your opinion didn't matter? Why? Well, you know, and growing up was pretty volatile in my household as well. So it, it all like little school, high school, very shy. University, painful shy. So. And when did that leave you? Um, probably when I graduated. Clearly, it's left you, Karen. It, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it probably wasn't until I finished. University at Western, and then went on to pursue some the, the graduate degrees that I did. Yeah, you have three degrees. Yeah, the left school. So it was. Um, so it's been a journey, and and so and and I will say that, that the last few months at uh, council has helped that as well. So, in your perfect world, when you would love to be the mayor of Toronto, <laughs> maybe in a perfect world, uh, I've enjoyed getting to know you behind the scenes your dog's name, what your morning routine is like, <laughs> as well as where some of that determination and where that strength came from. And I want to open it up to questions from anybody here who I'm sure they have a lot of, and I think we have some microphones. So feel free. This is your chance. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thanks very much. I, I actually live in Ward 16 as well. Oh, okay. um, wondering if you could tell us a bit about what helped you break through when it came to communicating with your peer, your colleagues. You said it was like, you know, very difficult communicating with this group of men in a way you hadn't experienced before. So maybe what were some of the kind of nuggets of what is working and how you've shifted that? Yeah, I think, um, so unfortunately the, in the game of politics, um, people listen when they think you have the power. And they, even though I was communicating these problems, I was not seen as someone who had any power. And so it wasn't until I called a special meeting, uh, revamped the commission, and um, demonstrated that I actually did have the power that they listened. So I, it, um, you know, in a perfect world, you wouldn't have to go there, but politics is not perfect. Now they listen. Yeah. <laughs> so. Karen, I just wanted to ask you a little bit. You talked a little bit, you know, sort of five years ago. You might not have had the thick enough skin to take the criticism. With the work you do, you, how do you? Is it just age, or how is it that now you're able to sort of manage it a little more? To me, I see that as one of the hardest things for what, what you do. Yeah, I think it, uh, it, part of it is age, experience, and, and conviction. Because um, it was a, a friend who actually sent me a text during the whole thing, and it was Margaret Thatcher, and I'm going to misquote it, but she, Margaret Thatcher basically said, by the time they're throwing mud at you, you've already won the policy debate because they have nothing left. If, they have, if all they're doing is attacking you personally, there's nothing left for them to argue. You've won. So 
So. So I think about that. Hi, thank Hi. you so much for coming this morning. I do have a question for you. In being in the public eye, um, when people, have you ever had an, uh, um, an instance where someone's misrepresented something that you've either done or something that you've said in confidence, and if that's ever happened to you, how have you handled that? Uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, there have been several occasions along the way when people are not liking the direction that you're going, and they will misrepresent things to get a different outcome. And I, and I, I don't think that's unique to politics, I think that's probably about life. And um, I think the one thing that I'm much better at now is not reacting, but just being calm and, and, and saying, well, you know, there will be a time that I can correct this, but in the moment, it's not the time. And um, that has been a learning process as well, because when I was first elected, it happened, and I took the bait, and I, you know, you, you, you get into arguments with people, and, and, and again, you're never gonna win the argument. So now it's just a taking a step back, being calm, not reacting at the time, and um, but you know working on your goal and making sure that you make sure your message is consistent and out there. Is that the engineer training from your father? Exactly. <laughs> to decide to build a box, box for it. Right, yeah. A lot of times when we're challenged or when someone yeah. misrepresents us, that's what we want to do: defend ourselves right yes. away. A little bit of that perhaps comes from being a woman and feeling like, wait a minute, you can't attack me on that. Right. You know, don't try to take anything away from me. How do you do that then? How do you step back and say, not right now? You know, that's just experience. That is just because I have reacted in the past and it has um, never worked out. And it has um, consistently, it has gotten me into trouble, more trouble than, than the initial case of misrepresentation. So that, that's just fully experience. Saying, okay, you know what, I know what this is. I recognize this and um, I'm not gonna take the bait. Hello, I'm Tammy Sturge from HR Transformations. Um, you can count on my boat, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> um, what's happened with Gary Webster? So Gary has retired. He, um, the, the, the compensation package that he received uh, means that he can't, he, can't, he can't earn another income. So he has gone to his cottage in, uh, in Muskoka, and he's, he's fully retiring. So, I mean, I think, uh, just a quick footnote on that, I mean, he was gonna retire likely this year anyway. And um, so he didn't get to retire in the way that he had envisioned, but we did have a party for him that was a wonderful closure where we were able to, I'm not gonna say laugh, but at least have a, have a more positive goodbye than, than what that day depicted for him. So, and I, I, that will be his memory, I think, of his time at the TTC. Hi, Karen. Uh, thank you for being Hi. so inspiring. <laughs> Um, I think we've, you've demonstrated with your stance um, on, on the subways that, that you can sort of balance the, the, the line the politician has to walk between scruples and um, you know, making the right decision. But going forward, uh, the politician's life is never easy. What guiding principles are you going to use to help you make those decisions in the future? Yeah, I think it comes down to um, it, it, where you know, we hold the public trust. And, and, and what does that mean? It means that we need to spend the money wisely, we need to make sure that we do the most with what we have, and um, you know, we need to make sure at the end of the day that we can look in the mirror and say, yeah, and, and I can look at my kids and say, yeah, that was the right decision. Or given all the information I had at the time, that was the right decision. And um, so it, um, there's always conflicting constituencies, and people will always tell you, you know, I want this, I want you to do that. But fundamentally, they're, they're bringing a perspective that is important to inform your opinion. But ultimately, um, as a public official, you, know, you, you, you hold all the cards and all the facts. And, and through that, you weed through, OK, what do I really think is the right thing to do? And sometimes we make mistakes. Even though we think we're acting in the public interest, we make mistakes. And then, then you have an obligation to stand up and say, you know what, this wasn't the right thing, and we're going to fix it. I got the power. 
power. That's what I feel like I'm singing with you. Um, now that you have the power, so now that you have, in politics, earned your right to have a voice, yeah. you've got a voice, uh, what kind of extra pressure does that put on you now? You've got some power. Yeah, and it has um, it's certainly, um, again, in, you know, in that next level of, okay, now there's work to do, we need a plan, we need to fund it, we need to get on with it. Um, being mindful, to your point, that um, we need to be that much more responsible and uh, inclusive and collaborative um, because whatever, when, when I go out with an initiative with my colleagues, people will pay attention and we have, uh, we have an obligation to make sure that we have all the right facts and all the right information and that we're doing something in the public interest. And you know, I learned that. I, it's like a silly innocuous tweet I sent out because I, I was bike riding and I, 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 I went through a rolling stop at a stop sign and it, I got pulled over by the police and they said, you can't, you can't do that. I'm like, you know, you're right, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so I sent out a tweet like, be careful to stop at stop signs. And then I had three media outlets calling me and it was, became a story. And you're like, really? <laughs> so, I mean, that, that, that level, so I, I am aware now, to, more, more aware to your point that, um, that I do have a voice and that, um, and that you need to make sure that we're moving responsibly. It's a different challenge, isn't it? It is a different challenge, there's no question. There's no question. Good morning. What changed as a result of the things that you learned on Undercover Boss? And are you yeah. still in contact with your pals, your coworkers? Yes, I am. Actually, I'm going to see Sylvia after after this because she invited me to Victoria Park Station for a coffee. So <laughs> it was um, for me very beneficial because I had not had the long history with the TTC, and I had just been in that role. And being an elected official um, at a point in time when the public trust in the TTC had been waning, um, to hear the employees speak with such pride about the work that they did. And, um, and you know Sylvia, for 24 years, comes in every day and cleans the station. And um, you know I asked her, what, "What was your best day on the job?" And she said, "The day I got hired." And I'm like, "Oh my goodness, why can't the world see this?" And so that was for me one of those moments that um, you know we that it, and I view the TTC as a bit of a mirror to the city. That you know our TTC is seen in decline, and it's a reflection of our city potentially being in decline. And if we can turn the TTC around, then what can we do for the city? And the opportunities are enormous for us. And so hearing those employees talk about how much they had pride actually helped inform our mission statement for the TTC, which is to build a, trans to build a transit system that makes Toronto proud. And it had, not, had it not been for that experience, then that, that mission statement may have evolved differently. You would have heard a lot of complaining, I imagine. From employees, because this is, you know, when they're when they're talking in amongst yeah. themselves and they're yeah. frustrated about things. Yeah. Did you hear any frustrations about yourself? No. No. Yeah. But again, they, I mean, was, that would be awkward later on. Yeah, that would have been awkward. <laughs> but uh, but no, it was it was good. And it, there was also that moment of like, you know, I jumped in with both feet to that exercise, and halfway through, I'm like, the employees may not like this. Actually, yeah. <laughs> this may not be as well received as I think it might be. Um, as it turned out, it was incredibly well received and um, did a lot to I think the spirits of the employees who had felt that they were you know, under constant media scrutiny, under constant criticism, that they had their moment to shine, which I think helped. Unfortunately, we only have time for one last question. Oh, hi. I'm sure. Shirley Dock, Erin, and uh, I'm a TTC user. And um, so we hear an awful lot about um, the service and the future projects, the big infrastructure stuff, how do we find the funding, etc. You know, we have an existing product out there right now, and as you say, it, it, to a degree, it's in decline. And I'm just wondering, with your new CEO, um, new commission, etc., what might a, a, a user of the TTC today um, be able to expect over the course of the next 24 months to arrest that decline? Yeah, no, that's. Um, thank you for that question. And I know we're short on time, so I, I'll, I'll give the elevator speech. But for the, for the first time, I think, in a long time, we have the three pillars that we need to create the change in the organization that we've been waiting to see. So we've got the reinvestment in, in the TTC cars. We've got the new street cars coming. We've got the new subway cars. We've got an expansion plan. We're implementing smart card payment system. We're going to bring um, wireless into the, into the stations. So we're investing in some of our physical infrastructure. We've also got a reinvestment in our management culture. 
that we've got a new CEO who is dynamic, who is bringing modern management tools to the organization. We're measuring performance. We're customer service focused. And coupling that with the infrastructure investment is, is I think, will be meaningful to, to the rider and their experience. But and the final piece that is, in my mind, one of the more critical and more exciting pieces is that we're redefining the relationship with the union. And we are, we are having um, really positive discussions and the union is recognizing that its success is dependent on the organization's success and that is viewed through the lens of the customer. And so whether it's 24 months, 36 months, I don't know. But what I do know is that in five years' time, it will be an entirely different organization. And, um, and I, I think we will have achieved our mission statement.